what we had, so just to reiterate what we had was a polynomial fit. for C p and what you have been given are constants a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5 and in two ranges. So, this is just a pure polynomial you will get C p. Integrating C p d t you will get h, you will need a constant of integration which depends on the enthalpy of formation at standard state which is 25 degrees. So, you will get a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5 and a 6 which comes from the constant of integration okay. and again this is for h. Similarly, for s you will have a constant of integration a 7 which will tell you what the entropy is at 25 degrees C. So, if I put T is 298 Kelvin I should get my value. Uh, for the entropy at 29 uh, 25 degrees Celsius. So, we have this whole set of uh, values for us and these are well tabulated values and we will use them uh, very often for all our calculations. So, this is something that is a useful set of information to have. So, once this is done all I do is that let us say that I want um, the heat of a reaction, I will say let us say C H 4 plus twice O 2 gives C O 2 plus twice H 2 O. Then I find H F 0 for this at 25 degrees C. This I do not need to look up because at 25 degrees C this is 0, this is assigned 0. I will get H F 0 at 25 degrees C. I will get H F 0 at 25 degrees C. I will just subtract this and this and I will get delta H R. So, this is how I will get the heat of reaction. Now, uh, once you have a fuel there is something which is called as a calorific value and what is the calorific value? It is just going to be if you see it is just going to be the negative of the heat of reaction and expressed as per kg or per mole. So, for example, if I uh, use this reaction and I get delta H r, uh, the delta H r would be for 1 mole for 1 mole of C H 4 burning, this is the amount of energy released. Delta H r go is going to be a negative quantity because it is an exothermic reaction but we will say that the calorific value is the negative of that. So, we want to express the calorific value as a positive quantity. So, we will say the negative value of delta H r. So, minus delta H r is the C v for 1 mole of C H 4. Now, you can say that 1 mole of C H 4 is really 12 grams plus 4 grams this is carbon, this is hydrogen. So, it is totally 16 grams. So, this much uh, energy was released for 16 grams, how much energy would be released for 1 kilogram and I can get the calorific value on a per kg basis. Now, it happens that if I have gaseous species, species normally C v is expressed in molar or volume basis. Whereas, if it is a solid fuel or even a liquid fuel, so you express C v on a per kg basis. So, for example, we say what is C v for 1 kg of carbon or something like this. So, uh, we will just come to that and um, what I can write now is that if I use 1 kg of carbon. Okay, and I convert it to C O 2 using 1, uh, let us say 1 kg of carbon, I should say that 12 kg of carbon is really corresponding to uh, 1 mole of carbon, 1 kilo mole of carbon, sorry. 
So, 12 kg of carbon uh, uh, corresponds to 1 kilo mole of carbon, 12 grams corresponds to 1 mole of carbon, but you realize that if I wrote it as a chemical reaction, it would have been C plus O 2 giving C O 2. So, I would have written 1 mole of carbon plus 1 mole of O 2 gives 1 mole of C O 2. Okay, but if I write it in kilogram 1 mole or sorry, let me write it as all in kilo mole, so that I can work in kilograms, because I would rather work in kilograms here. If I write it as 1 kilo mole, this would have been 12 kilogram of carbon, this would be 32 kilogram of oxygen and this would be 44 kilogram of CO 2. So, for 12 kilogram of carbon, I require 32 kilogram of oxygen and this is to ensure complete combustion. So, what do we understand by complete combustion? So, if I have any species which is made up of a hydrocarbon okay, C N H M, then all C is converted to C O 2. So, that means, if there is C N, I should form N times C O 2 and all H should form H 2 O. Okay, since there is M H in the fuel, there will be M by 2 H 2 O in the product. So, once I have complete combustion, only then I must have calculate the delta H R and that is called as a negative of this is the calorific value. Okay. So, we do not uh, assign a calorific value if carbon is going to C O or something like that. Calorific value is defined if there is complete combustion. So, if I have one as uh, getting back to my reaction, if I have 1 kilogram of C, then I will require. So, if you look here for 12 kilogram of carbon, I require 32 kilogram of oxygen. So, for 1 kilogram, I will require 32 by 12, 32 by 12 kilogram of oxygen and I will form 44 by 12 kilograms of CO 2. So, this is writing it in kilogram basis. Uh, of course, you will see that it is all balanced here, there is no problem, all the mass is balanced on either side. I take 1 kilogram, 32 by 12 kilograms, if I add it up, I get 44 by 12 kilograms. So, things are balanced because I used a balanced reaction and I just substituted the molecular weight for every species. So, that ensures that the mass is still balanced. Now, if I do this reaction, it turns out that the energy that you release is 32.78 mega joules. Okay, and, and hence the calorific value. So, this is delta H r would be minus 32.78 mega joules for 1 kilogram of carbon. So, the calorific value for pure carbon would be 32.78 mega joules per kg. So, you realize that uh, you know this is a pretty high number and uh, this is something that uh, you probably should uh, remember as an order of magnitude. I mean roughly somewhere in the 30s, you will get the calorific values for carbon and you realize that this is expressed on a per kilogram basis. Now, what I will do is I will still use the same uh, thing for hydrogen, though it is a gas, I will uh, get it in terms of uh, per kilogram basis. So, if I have 1 kilogram of H 2, uh, again if I write the balance reaction, you see that H 2 plus sorry plus half O 2 gives me H 2 O. This means, if I work in kilo moles, this is 2 kilograms, since this is half O 2, 1 mole of O 2 would have been 30, 1 kilo mole of O 2 would have been 32 kilograms, this is 16 kilograms and this is 18 kilograms. Okay. So, 1 kg of H 2 would have required 8 kgs of O 2 and they would have given you 9 kg of H 2 O. But if I use 1 kilogram of H 2 O and you know add 8 kilograms of O 2 and get 18 kilogram of H sorry not 18 9 kilograms of H 2 O 
the energy released is uh, we normally express it in terms of two values. It is either 141.96 megajoules or it is 120.0 megajoules and the two values are the values depending on when H 2 O is either in the liquid state or in the gaseous state. So, you realize that if it is in the liquid state, then it would have given out even the H F G that is uh, uh, this so called latent heat also would have been released, whereas in gaseous form that latent heat would still be there with uh, H 2 O. So, if I go to the liquid form, I will release far more energy and this is what is released if H 2 O is in liquid form and this is what is released if H 2 O is in the gaseous form. So, this is called as the higher heating value or the higher calorific value and this is what is called as a lower calorific value uh, for hydrogen. Now, if I look on a per kilogram basis, you let us see this value 141.96 megajoules are released for 1 kilogram of H 2, whereas if you look for carbon it was only 32.78 megajoule for 1 kilogram of carbon. So, you realize that for hydrogen the amount of energy released per kilogram basis is very, very high it's more than 4 times that for carbon. Not only that in this case the by product was C O 2, here the by product is H 2 O which is considered as benign and this is one of the reasons that people always keep talking of this hydrogen economy. They say that if we have hydrogen as a fuel, not only are we going to release lot of energy, but you know the pollution will be less. But you realize that you know this is going to be feasible only if we had hydrogen at our disposal. We do not have hydrogen at our disposal. Uh, we need to create hydrogen from water for example, in which case we will actually provide this energy to water to get hydrogen. So, that means that you know there is no uh, feasibility for using hydrogen as a fuel overall. What we can use it is, we can use generate hydrogen at places where there is lot of energy and specifically at places where we require very high energy output using very small amount of uh, fuel, we can use hydrogen. But the overall economy just cannot run on hydrogen because we do not have hydrogen uh, supply with us. So, but you should still see that hydrogen releases a lot of energy compared to carbon and uh, this is something that you must keep in mind. Now, you will realize that most hydrocarbons are you know formed of sorry most hydrocarbons are formed of uh, carbon and hydrogen. Okay. So, they will have a C V which is higher than 32 and far lower than you know uh, 140. In fact, for most of the fuels that we look at that is uh, gasoline or diesel, you will see that the range is anywhere between 42 to 48 megajoule per kg. So, this is something that you will notice often that this is the range in which most of the calorific values will lie for the fuels that are of interest to us. So, this is again uh, some kind of figure that people should be at least aware of that uh, this is what is uh, happening. So, once this is done, we will come to other concepts which is stoichiometric amount of air and this is something which most students are aware of it just uh, something which needs to be reiterated. So, these are other concepts in uh, combustion okay, and used very often in IC engines etcetera. So, if I have a fuel C n H m, then uh, the for 1 mole of this fuel I will have uh, 12 multiplied by n plus 1 multiplied by m or 12 n plus m. So, sorry this is 1 kilo mole let us say I will have 12 n plus m kgs of the fuel. I will require for each n, I will require 1 O 2. So, I will require n O 2. Now, if I have m h, then I will form m by 2 H 2 O, which means I will require m by 4 oxygen. 
so I will require m by 4 oxygen, okay, which means by default I will have n plus m by 4 uh, multiplied by 3.76 nitrogen. Now, if I want to find out what is the mass of this, you will realize that I will have n plus m by 4 multiplied by 32 plus n plus m by 4 multiplied by 3.76 multiplied by 28, which is the molecular weight of nitrogen. So, many kilograms of air. So, this is assuming that I have formed n CO 2 and um, m by 2 H 2 O. So, you re realize that 1 kilo mole of C n H m fuel means 12 n plus m kilograms of the fuel and if I achieve complete combustion, which means I transform all my carbon into C O 2, which means I form n C O 2 and I form m by 2 H 2 O, I will require n plus m by 4 more kilo moles of oxygen, which means n plus m by 4 multiplied by 32 kilograms of oxygen and correspondingly those many moles multiplied by 3.76 uh, moles for nitrogen and I will just multiply it by 28 to get the amount of nitrogen. So, this, this is the mass of air required and this is the mass of fuel. So, what we have is what is standardly called as air to fuel stoichiometric ratio, which is basically mass of air upon mass of fuel for stoichiometric combustion and stoichiometric combustion is nothing, but when the reaction is exactly balanced and you form complete uh, combustion that is you form C O 2 and H 2 O and not incomplete where you form C O or something like this. So, this is what is called as stoichiometric air fuel ratio and you will realize that that would be nothing but n plus m by 4 32 plus 3.76 multiplied by 28 upon 12 n plus m. So, this would be my stoichiometric air fuel ratio if I am using a hydrocarbon fuel. Uh, you will realize that if we consider most of our fuels uh, that is liquid or gaseous fuels, um, in many cases they will be alkanes. I mean it is not that they are purely alkanes, they are a mixture of alkanes, alkenes, alkynes etcetera. But if I consider them as alkanes, you know the regular formula for alkanes is C n H 2 n plus 2, okay. but when n increases um, to a large value, this 2 will be a very, very small number. For example, C 20 H 42. Okay. So, you know tending if you n starts going uh, larger and larger, the 2 will pale in significance to this n and roughly you know you can say that these formula are of the type C n H 2 n. Okay, that is the alkene formula roughly this is only for calculation purposes. So, you will realize that irrespective of the uh, number of carbon and hydrogen, if the formula is roughly C n H 2 n, then for every n a fixed amount of oxygen is required, for every 2 h a fixed amount of oxygen is required. So, irrespective of the weight of the alkane, I will require a fixed amount of mass for a fixed amount of uh, mass of the fuel. So, the air fuel ratio here if I look at this, this is n, this is 2 n by 4, this is fixed, this is if I write only in terms of n, I will just write it as n plus n by 2 times 32 plus 3.76 multiplied by 28 and 12 n plus m is 2 n. So, 14 n, I will just n I will take out and you will get roughly 1.5 multiplied by 32 plus 3.76 times 28 upon 14. So, you will see that air fuel ratio for most alkanes is nearly constant. Ok. 
okay, and uh, this will tend to four, roughly 14.7, you can check it out. Only for the lower alkanes, okay, so for example, if I write CH4, you realize that immediately H is actually 4 times the carbon. If you go to C2H6, it is still you know uh, 6 by 2, which is 3 times. So, for the lower alkanes, the air fuel ratio will be higher and you will realize it should be the highest for methane and it is around 17.16. Okay. So, if I plot air fuel ratio versus N, sorry, I will see 17.16 and it will go to 14.7 for most of the higher alkanes, this is higher alkanes. Okay, and you will realize that this is if you check any fuel like petrol and diesel, it will be slightly greater than 14.7, it is n is still not that high, but it is tending to a higher value and you will see maybe roughly around 15 or something as the air fuel ratio for petrol and diesel. This is the stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Now, in most combustion processes whether in power plants or IC engines, you do not provide stoichiometric amount of air. In fact, a lot of times you provide more air than required. So, for uh, doing this, you have another factor which is called as the equivalence ratio, okay, and you call it as phi. So, phi is defined either as mass of fuel upon mass of air actual upon mass of fuel upon mass of air stoichiometric or you can write it in terms of air fuel ratio A by F stoichiometric upon A by F uh, actual. So, for example, if I consider the same amount of mass of air, if my mass of fuel is more than the stoichiometric mass of fuel, you will realize that phi will be greater than 1, but this means that I have provided more fuel than required which means the air is less than required for that fuel and since uh, it is more fuel than required, such a mixture is called as a rich mixture. Okay. So, basically it is rich in fuel. Now, mostly combustion uh, is rarely done with rich mixtures, though you will see that in the beginning when you want to start the car, uh, usually some amount of rich mixture is required. So, only at that point you will slightly run with a richer mixture and phi will be greater than 1, but in most diesel vehicles or in power plants, you will not run with rich mixtures. In fact, your phi will be much less than 1, that means you would have provided far more air than required and such mixtures are called as lean mixtures. Okay. So, these are some things that you must uh, remember. There is something else which is called as the excess air factor, okay, which is the same thing again, you know, told in a different manner. So, excess air factor is just air by fuel actual minus air by fuel stoichiometric upon air by fuel stoichiometric multiplied by 100. So, it is expressed as a percentage. So, if the air by fuel actual is the same as air by fuel stoichiometric, this is 0. So, excess air factor is 0, which means you have provided exactly the amount of air that is required. If you provide let us say twice the amount of air, then this and this uh, would be exactly, this will be twice of this. So, I would get air by fuel stoichiometric upon air by fuel stoichiometric into 100. So, it is 100. So, excess air factor of 100 means you have provided exactly twice the amount of fuel. Now, if you provide less than stoichiometric, obviously, A, A by F actual would be lesser than A by F stoichiometric and you would have provided a lesser amount of air. You will see that the numerator would be negative. So, whenever the excess air factor is negative, it means you have provided less air than required and it is a rich mixture. That is because it is rich in fuel or it is you know less of air required. So, these are some things. So, negative values here imply rich mixtures. So, these are just some kind of terminologies or you know regular jargon which is associated with this place or with this field. What you must really uh, remember is that 
what is stoichiometric air fuel ratio, roughly what are the values for regular hydrocarbons and that you mostly will provide slightly more air than required and this is something that is to be kept in mind. Now, this is uh, to do uh, you know, most of the discussion here we did with fuels which we could write as C n H 2 m. Now, uh, what happens in solid fuels is that if I am using let us say coal, okay. in this case usually we will talk of the composition of coal in mass basis. Okay. So, composition is given normally in mass basis okay. and whenever composition in is given in mass basis, it is called a gravimetric basis. So, when I say gravimetric composition, it means that you have given something in a mass basis. So, for example, I can say that some uh, sample of coal of coal has 60 percent carbon, uh, 4 percent hydrogen, 2 percent nitrogen, 8 percent oxygen, remaining ash. So, coal can have various compounds inbuilt, it can even have nitrogen and oxygen. So, the normal thing that we say is that nitrogen and ash will not participate in combustion okay whereas any oxygen in fuel will be used up first so what does this mean this means that if I want to do an analysis, typically what I say is that okay, you have this amount of coal, I want to find out air fuel ratio stoichiometric, what should I do now? So, you say take 100 grams of that coal, which means I will have 60 gram, sorry, 100 kilograms of coal, which means I will have 60 kilograms of carbon. And now, we have already done this analysis before. If we have 60 kilograms of carbon, it means I have 60 by 12 kilo mole of carbon, which means I will require 60 by 12 kilo mole of oxygen, because for 1 kilo mole of carbon I require 1 uh, kilo mole of oxygen, which means I will require 60 by 12 multiplied by 32 kilogram of oxygen. So, similarly for 4 kilogram H 2, I will require 4 by 4 multiplied by 32 kilogram of or it means I will require 32 kilogram O2. So, you re realize that the net uh, uh, kilograms of oxygen would be 60 by 12 multiplied by 32 plus 32, which means 60 by 12 plus 1, which is 72 by 12 multiplied by 32 kilogram of oxygen. And you realize that 1 kilo mole oxygen corresponds to 3.76 kilo mole N2 or 32 kilogram oxygen corresponds to 3.76 multiplied by 28 kilograms N2. So, here you had 72 by 12, which is 6 times 32 kilograms of oxygen would mean 6 times 3.76 multiplied by 28 kilograms of N2. Okay. But before this, I realized that there was some oxygen in the fuel already. So, I should not be doing this step, rather I should first subtract available oxygen, which means I will say external oxygen required 
is actually 6 multiplied by 32 minus whatever is already there which is 8 kilograms of oxygen. Okay. So, these many kilograms of oxygen is required externally. So, then I will substitute that value here and accordingly calculate my N 2. So, the N 2 will not be this rather I will first calculate how many kilograms of oxygen are required uh, from outside and hence I will calculate my N 2 and the external air required is based on this value is based on this value. After I do this, I will just then I would have said for 100 kilogram of fuel, I will require some whatever I get from here that is uh, this is 6 mul. Let me just do it. 6 twos are 12, 6 threes are 18, 192 kilogram minus 8 would be 184 kilogram of oxygen, which means uh, 184 multiplied by 3.76 multiplied by 28 upon 32 kilogram of N2. So, I will add up these two numbers to get my external air and I will divide it by 100. So, let me say that if I add up these two numbers, which is uh, 184 plus 184 multiplied by sorry 3.76 to kilogram of air okay, and then air to fuel ratio would be just this let me call as x. So, it will be just x by 100 and this is my stoichiometric air fuel ratio, because I have converted all my carbon to CO 2 and H 2 to H 2 O and this is what I will get. So, this is what is called as then if I provide excess air, the air will be more than this. So, this is the way to proceed. Now, you realize that you know all of this would have given you some amount of exhaust gases made up of CO 2 and H 2 O. And if you have incomplete combustion, you would get CO. In fact, even if you provide good amount of air, if complete combustion does not occur, you will get CO and even O2 in the product. And normally, what is done to test out uh, incomplete combustion is what is called as an exhaust gas analysis. And you will realize that you know I can always write equation C H 4 plus oxygen. Let us say this is A C H 4 plus B oxygen plus B multiplied by 3.76 nitrogen will give me something like X C O 2 plus Y C O plus Z O 2 plus B multiplied by 3.76 N 2. So, I have undergone some kind of uh, reaction, I this must be balanced that means, the amount of carbon here x plus y should be equal to a this is carbon balance and the amount of uh, oxygen which means x plus sorry this is y c o again I have made a mistake y C O. So, it is y by 2 plus z should be equal to b. Okay, sorry, there should be uh, let us say u times h 2 o here. So, this is not only this, I have missed out. So, x plus y, these are the carbon atoms on the right side, they should be equal to the carbon atoms on the left side. Now, uh, if I consider uh, hydrogen you will see that there are 4 a hydrogens on the left side and uh, I should have 2 u. Okay, these are the amount of uh, hydrogen atoms on the right side, they should be equal to 4 a and then if I calculate the oxygen on the left side it is b, but on the right side I have x plus y by 2 uh, plus u by 4 plus z which is unburnt oxygen. 
So, the net oxygen if I add up in all these four, these are the four things that I have put in, they should add up to B and this is would be a balanced reaction. Now, what I should know is how much of each of these is there on the right side, this gives me an idea of what kind of combustion is occurring and whether incomplete combustion is occurring, whether good mixing is not taking place. So, one of the standard apparatuses that we normally talk of is what is called as the ORSAT apparatus. So, this is nothing but a simple uh, three bottle apparatus, apparatus to analyze exhaust gases. So, bottle 1 is normally made up of NaOH and this absorbs CO2. Bottle 2 is usually made up of something called as pyrogallic acid in NaOH KOH solution and this absorbs CO and bottle 3 is made up of cuprous chloride in a solution of acids HCl and NH3 and this absorbs O2. So, what you do is you pass or you collect the exhaust gas above water which means the moment you collect it above water, any water in the exhaust gases will dissolve in the water and only the gases will come out. And you see that a typical in this reaction, okay, you would have had CO2, CO, O2, N2 and water. The water would get absorbed in the water uh, that you are using to collect the gas and you are remain and you remain with four gases which is CO2, CO, O2 and N2 mostly assuming the fuel is uh, hydrocarbon and you have used only air. So, and again the order is important here because bottle 1 apparently can also absorb CO. So, you need to ensure that you pass, once you collect the exhaust gas, you pass it through these three bottles. So, the first bottle will absorb CO2, the second bottle will absorb CO, the third bottle will absorb O2 and you can figure out how much the absorption is uh, and then whatever remains will be only N2. Okay. So, once we have this, that means on the right side, we will have information for x, y, z and this. So, all this will be known to us, these numbers once we calculate. This will be unknown because it has just mixed with water, but using these equations, three equations, there are three unknowns a, b and u and we can easily find whatever we want, what has happened or what kind of reaction may have occurred. So, this is something that we can find out whether we used more air than required, whether we used less air than required, whether in spite of using more air than required, we have had incomplete combustion. Such information is then obtained using this exhaust gas analysis and a few of the problems that we have in the exercise sheet are related to this. So, uh, this is as far as exhaust gas analysis is concerned. So, the last topic that we normally would cover in uh, in combustion is what is called as the adiabatic flame temperature. So, let me just write that adiabatic flame temperature. So, what is this adiabatic flame temperature? So, uh, all this time we were talking of the enthalpy of a reaction where all the species were brought back to the standard state and then we calculated the heat of reaction or the enthalpy of reaction. But let us say we do not do that and let the uh, energy released increase the temperature of the uh, species. So, what this means is that if I consider a control volume, I have put in some fuel, I have put in some air and this is completely you know adiabatic that is no q transfer here and here are zero so you can imagine 
let us say a regular uh, boiler of a power plant or a combustion chamber in a gas turbine engine or a combustion chamber uh, in an aeroplane. Okay. So, these are well insulated combustion chambers, I mean and we will assume that such chambers are adiabatic and if I put in a certain amount of fuel and air, okay, the exhaust gases at that time will have a certain temperature. Okay. And since this entire thing was done adiabatically, whatever temperature the exhaust gases reach is called as the adiabatic flame temperature. Okay. And what will the temperature be? Now, since the entire thing is adiabatic, you will realize that the enthalpy coming in should be the enthalpy going out, because there has been no net Q in and out and anyway work was assumed to be 0, net work in and out is assumed to be 0 and things go in and come out at the same pressure. So, what do we do then? The simple way to look at this is that I just plot my H versus T here. So, I told you that for any species, you know I could have just plotted a line like this of how H varies. So, this is 298 Kelvin okay, and this is how H will vary as a function of temperature. Now, let us say I add up, so let us say I have a set of reactants which is CH4, O2, and N 2. Now, if the reactants begin at room temperature, then I know the enthalpy of reactants, which means I add up the enthalpy of CH 4, O 2 and N 2. Okay. N 2 and O 2 at uh, 298 Kelvin would be 0 and CH 4 would have some value, you will see that it is negative. So, I will be here. If I heated the air, even oxygen and nitrogen would have some enthalpy and at some other temperature, let us say in many uh, combustion chambers, uh, the air is preheated, in which case uh, the enthalpy of the reactants would be different. So, I would have to calculate the enthalpy of CH 4 O 2 N 2 at the temperature in which they have entered the combustion chamber. So, for example, if the if then uh, the temperature of the combustion chamber is 200 degrees Celsius, which means it is 273 plus 200 or 473 Kelvin, then I will have to calculate the enthalpy of CH 4 at 473 Kelvin, O 2 at 473 Kelvin, N 2 at 473 Kelvin. And what I will do is, I will just use the tables that have been given to you, the curve fit values. So, for example, curve fit values have been given to you for most fuels as well as CO, CO 2, H 2. H2O, N2. Okay. So, what you will see is that I just have to put the values of, uh, of or the value of 473 as the temperature and I will get the enthalpy for all these species. So, I will get the enthalpy of the reactant. So, let us say this is the enthalpy of the reactants. Let me say now we are at 298 Kelvin. Now, if I look at the enthalpy of the products, it better be lower than the enthalpy of the uh, reactants at the standard state. because the enthalpy of reaction has to be negative. So, the enthalpy of the products at 298 Kelvin is lower than the enthalpy of reactants at 298 Kelvin. So, this is where you are delta H r, which is negative. So, this is the product. So, at 298 Kelvin, the enthalpy of products will be lower than the enthalpy of reactants. So, let us say I have CO 2, H 2 O and N 2 at 298 Kelvin, N 2 would anyway be 0. If I add up these two and uh, I put the value here, it will be here. Now, obviously, as temperature changes, the enthalpy of these species also increase and I will get some curve like this. Now, of course, I have drawn a certain curve, smooth curve. The curves need not be smooth, depending on how C p varies, the curves will be in some wavy fashion. But you realize that I have plotted the enthalpy like this this is the enthalpy of reaction at the standard state. Now, if I have the whole control volume as adiabatic, then the enthalpy of products is the same as the enthalpy of the reactants, which means that I will draw a horizontal line passing through the enthalpy of the reactants and see where it will cut the enthalpy line for the products. So, if I have some kind of an adiabatic process, then along this line, the enthalpy is constant, because this is a constant enthalpy line. I have made it a horizontal line here. 
and what is happening is that whatever is the enthalpy of the reactants that is the same as the enthalpy of the products along this line and wherever it cuts here I see what temperature this is and this is the temperature that the species that the product species will reach if the situation is entirely adiabatic and this temperature is then called as the adiabatic flame temperature. So, this is uh, as straightforward as it is if I just draw these two curves you realize that what is the adiabatic flame temperature. So, H products is the same as H reactants. Okay. When then find, so to for example, to find H of the reactants is very straightforward because the temperature of the reactants is given to you. So, this is easy, okay. but to find this Uh, this temperature is not easy. All you know is that step 1 calculate H of reactants which is straightforward. Step 2 find T such that H uh, product is equal to H reactant. Okay. So, you have to ensure that the product H is the same as reactant H. Now, you realize that the product H can be uh, or the temperature can be at a obtained. Uh, if I just put in some temperature in the curve fit values, I will get some product H. I will have to keep on varying and do trial and error to, to see at which temperature I will get the enthalpy of products to be the same as the enthalpy of reactants. And so, you will realize that this can be a tedious uh, trial and error process. Uh, actually, we can simplify this process slightly by assuming a beginning value and uh, carry out the iterations in two or three steps. We will do it in the afternoon session when uh, we will do one problem, but just for the sake of um, uh, knowledge, what has been given to you is that if you look at the table. Uh, for a certain fuels, you will realize that uh, some kind of rough value of the adiabatic flame temperatures have been given. Okay, T adiabatic for methane, acetylene, ethane, ethene, etcetera have been given. And these uh, adiabatic, adiabatic temperatures you realize are somewhere around 2200 Kelvin, they may be plus minus some value. Okay. And uh, one thing you must realize is that um, if I have any species, let us say I have methane, okay, CH4 plus twice O2 plus 7.52 N2 and I think it should give you CO2 plus twice H2O plus 7.52 N2. Okay. If I assume this is the reaction at 298 Kelvin, I know this is H is 0, this is H is 0. So, H reactant would only be the H of this. Now, I need to guess the temperature for all for uh, this entire set such that the if I add up the three H's, I should get the same H here. Now, it turns out that at such high temperatures N 2 will react with oxygen form N O, N O 2 etcetera. And whenever such species are formed, they will eat up some energy and um, Usually, your adiabatic flame temperature that you calculate may not match what is given in the table, and that is because in the table they have assumed certain other reactions to form. Whereas, we will keep it very simple, we will say that N2 will never take part in reactions, and we will just say that all our reactions are such that we will not bother about any formation of N2O, NO, etcetera. We will keep it very simple this much that fuel plus oxygen and nitrogen gives you CO2, H2O and N2 and you just have to guess the value of T such that if you add up the three enthalpies here, they should give you the enthalpy of the reaction. So, that is something that we will just do. So, we will keep it very simple. The values that you will get will be only slightly off from the T adiabatic that is given in these tables uh, that you have been provided with.
So, this is the enthalpy of reaction uh, for uh, what is uh, you know I have just de, you know depicted it graphically and uh, something else that you must know is what is called as uh, the constant volume T adiabatic. Okay. So, for example, in an IC engine let us say at a certain point the volume does not change for example, in a petrol engine you know it is considered as instantaneous combustion where before the volume changes the entire uh, fuel is supposed to have combusted in a petrol engine. So, you realize at this point you are not letting the expansion work happen at all and it is a constant volume process and there is no expansion work and hence uh, if the whole process is adiabatic rather than H being the same it is actually U reactant is equal to U products. Okay. So, the internal energy is the same not the enthalpy that is because there is no expansion work involved and it is just a pure closed system the Q is 0, W is 0. So, finally, whatever U is there that will be um, uh, before the combustion and after the combustion the U should be the same. Now, what is normally done is that only H is tabulated. So, if H is tabulated and you want to use this equation, then you will just say that H uh, reactant minus P reactant V reactant is equal to H products minus P product V product. Now, obviously, it is a constant volume process. So, this and this are same you will realize that because the temperature increases and the moles also may not be conserved these will not be the same. Okay. But the left hand side totally is the same as the right hand side. So, for the reactants since you know the initial conditions H r is known okay, and instead of writing P V you will write N R T where this is N of reactants. R is R universal and T is the initial T and here you will write N products into R u into T adiabatic where this is the constant volume T adiabatic not the regular definition of adiabatic flame temperature. So, now what you have reduced this is that the left hand side is now straightforward. it is known you know the H you know N you know R you know T. So, LHS is known. On the right hand side everything is now a function of temperature okay, that is because I know how many products should form due to this set of reactants this is a universal gas constant and T adiabatic is the only unknown H is also a function of T adiabatic. So, I will now do trial and error and get my T adiabatic. So, it is the only unknown I uh, you know uh, guess a value of T adiabatic put it in the uh, polynomial expression find my u at a u see if it matches the left hand side if not then I will choose another guess and continue this process till I get what I want and we will see a simpler process when we continue. But overall you know I just want you to remember that you know this is just H reactants is equal to summation of H of all the reactants okay, and as a function of temperature this is H products, this is delta H R, this is H T. Okay, if I am beginning here, this is adiabatic flame temperature. Okay, the H P is same as H R. If you do this and remember what the adiabatic flame temperature is, it is very straightforward using these polynomial fits and we will continue I mean we, I have finished whatever I wanted to teach uh, or tell regarding combustion. So, we have talked about fuels, we have talked about stoichiometric air fuel ratio, we have talked about balancing, uh, we have talked about polynomial fits for C p so that you can get H and S and uh, we have talked about excess air factors and finally, we have talked about um, exhaust gas analysis and adiabatic flame temperature. So, these are some of the basics that you will require uh, regarding fuels and combustion and uh, though uh, you will realize that as far as adiabatic flame temperatures and the enthalpy is concerned, these are standard thermodynamic things that probably you ought to teach in such a course, but most of the things regarding exhaust uh, gas analysis and um, how much fuel you, how much air to fuel uh, ratio you require etcetera, 
such concepts are normally kept to the IC engine course or the power plant engineering course, but in general I have covered most of these here and you will see that most of these are based on simple chemical reaction concepts as well as concept regarding enthalpy being the same etcetera. So, I want to end uh, the topic of combustion here.